Deep Dive Film School makes no claim of ownership of the film footage used in this episode. The film footage is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Also, we're going to spoil the hell out of this movie, so this is your warning. Welcome to Deep Dive Film School. This week, we're going to end out our Disabilities Documented Festival with 2017 documentary, Unrest. Let's dive on in. All right, everybody, I'm Adam Sherlock. And I'm Adam Palcher. And if you like what you see slash hear, please like and subscribe. You can find us on all the what, Palcher? Spaces and places where people find good media, Sherlock. That's right, that's right. That's damn right. And we are ending <laughs> out our uh, Disabilities Documented Festival with uh, 2017's On Rest. This is a Netflix film. Uh, <clears throat> neither one of us had seen this before. We, we kind of were just were looking for something that was maybe very new. Mm -hmm. um uh, uh to talk about i guess uh, crib camp is even newer than this technically but sure um this I, when, is, when you say new I, I i was actually kind of looking for new disabilities that maybe aren't as in the lime uh, limelight limelight's not the right word but yes yeah, <laughs> yeah you know what i mean but that are probably underrepresented um, well and, and that's th the and bulk th that's the bulk of this movie right is yeah, this mm -hmm. is this thing that i think is God, and I don't know, I guess before we even start, I'll, I'll ask you, um, have you ever gone down this kind of a road before with anything, uh, uh, not, not, not specifically a myalgic encephalitis, but just s someone you love or yourself, there's something wrong and you don't know what, and you just start heading down that rabbit's hole to try and figure it out? Uh, fortunately, no, I have never been in a situation that Jennifer is here. Jennifer Brea, she's the one who wrote and directed this movie. Yes, and uh, I, 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 I unfortunately have in my own life uh, mm -hmm. with, 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 you know, I was having those silent migraines with, you know, uh, uh, vertigo and all the, like, it was so scary and it took so long and there is nothing more frustrating than continually having doctors be like yeah it's probably stress like it is like because then they're like okay now i've 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 uh one road is now a dead end so now i'm gonna pivot to another road but they're like oh we can't see you for six months and you're like sure rad <laughs> so six months of this before maybe i get another answer where somebody doesn't know what's going on yep. um mm -hmm. and that's so much of the bulk of this movie which i thought was really fascinating <laughs> And also super sad, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's totally sad. I mean, they, they the healthcare system really um, is not favorable for someone who has uh, has chronic fatigue sy syndrome or ME, like you like you were mentioning earlier. And it's really it's really interesting too. And I'd seen this before, and it's always pissed me off. Uh, but you know, eighty five percent of the people that have this disease are female, and the you know, and this is probably jumping around to the end a little bit, but they talk about how something that is built on skepticism can't really get approved funding. You think of something like Eastern medicine or something like this, but right. it also proves out, um, you know, the history of illness and how women are quickly dismissed is disgusting. Uh, you know, doctors quickly blame emotional stress. Oh, you're, you're hysteric. Oh, you're a hypochondriac. And this has happened for decades. And it's something that I, as a white guy, just never had thought about. And then I watched this piece. It was like, a, I don't know if it was like a John Oliver piece or something about it. And it was just shocking the differences that women get from men as far as treatment goes and mm -hmm. how quickly they are to dismiss like something, something not being there. Uh, well, and well, and and you and I touched on this. I touched on this a little bit when we did uh, animated life, uh, which is also that um, communities of color uh, who have gone in to try and get a diagnosis for their children uh, that are on the autism spectrum are often turned away and get treated as if they're bad parents who need to control their children better. Right? Like you need sure. to show more discipline. And that that exclusively happens to communities of color. So you're absolutely right that like, like the the pe anyone who was not a straight white male throughout the history of medicine, uh, yep. their their the the validity of their complaints or their concerns, more often than not, 
have been treated as if something is all in your head, which I just really quick. I want to say this because so much of this movie hinges around this. Obviously, first of all, just the stigma of what they decided to name this. Yes, there is myalgic encephalitis, but before that and after that, the name that is stuck is chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS. Mm -hmm. And just the name itself, they're like, you know, you saw all these (laughs) clips in this movie of, on Fox News then being like, it's the yuppie flu. I don't want to go to work either. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And it's like, <laughs> you, fuck you. Yeah, like, you like Ricky, these are Ricky people... Gervais on a stand-up comedy bit talking about it. Yeah, and, and you're like, yeah. you're like, dude, these people can't get out of bed. Like, and so like this this idea that so that's the first part is this idea that that somehow um this is all make believe or this is all in your head. Thing that I can't wrap my brain around, and I don't know if you're like this but to me to me i'm like okay what what causes heart attacks though what's the number one cause of heart attacks in people right it's it's stress stress right Mm -hmm. so it's high blood pressure that's created by stress well what is stress is stress a disease that you can catch from somebody else can someone cough and give you stress no it comes from your brain So to me, I'm like the entire idea of saying that something is a mental disorder. And so therefore the physicality of that disorder should be treated as secondary is so stupid to me. Cause I'm like, dude, you know how much stuff starts mentally and becomes physical all the time. Like, but, but for some reason in Western medicine, we have this idea that there is this wall, this like immense impenetrable wall. And on one side of it, is physical ailments and the other side of it is mental as if the two are not directly linked to one another in the way in which they affect the human body. So that's why like through the, this entire doc, I was like, I hate that we do this. Why do we do this? We separate it and it shouldn't be. Yeah. They, <clears throat> people don't have answers and they blame something else. I think is a big part of it. And You're you not know, trying like, hard enough. Yeah. Right. And like, and you know, I think uh, part of the reason she made this documentary, she just started filming herself. You know, we find out that about 17 million people in the world have this a million in the U S it is a spectrum disorder. So Mm -hmm. a quarter of those people are bedridden. A lot of them can just walk around and have normal lives, but the ones that are bedridden and we get to know a handful of these people and it is totally tragic, uh, what they're going through. And you know, we have this 22 year old girl in England who is just like, Jessica and she's got basically bones of a hundred year old and her dad starts singing her happy birthday and her mom like freaks out and is like, Hey, it's too loud. <laughs> right. You know, the, the, that yeah, is affecting even, her. Yeah. She can't even stand, you know, and even Jennifer's story, we, you know, she got like a hundred and four hundred and five fever and her husband Omar took her to the hospital and uh, it triggered something, right? Something wasn't right. And since then, she had like six infections in her first year and it kept she going just and wasn't really the stopped. same that's and she's that's op- why she says that it's like I, w- yeah. I came out of the hospital and i was not the same person exactly and you know you get this opening scene where she's just like crawling on the floor with no Ugh. energy uh and you know she has this awesome husband omar who i think uh, she's lucky to have yeah uh, definitely not, not all these people stick around f- like partner wise with this and he takes her to the hospital and there's this whole discussion of like, you know, how much do you say versus how much, how much is too much and how much is too. Oh my God. When he's whispering that to her and he's like, look, we need to find this fine line of how much to say and how much not to say, because if you say too much, they're going to send you to psychiatric Mm -hmm. and you just go, God, this is like, what a nightmare this is to try and, it shows the beauty and the power of the internet that she was able to find a community online. Right. Um, and be able to relate to these people and to, to the point near the end where she's, you know, organizing peaceful protests and making people aware of what CF, uh, CFS is and w- that it's a real thing. And a, a lot of people just think it's made up. You're just tired. Like you said, you know, and I think if it wasn't for her just filming everything, we wouldn't get quite, we would have no idea how long it lasts, right? And, and what she's going through because there's this brain fog, there's this numbness, you know. Like, honestly, there's there's most of the movie she's laying in bed or like 
crawling up the stairs and Omar's like, well, this is the least chivalrous thing I've ever done. Filming my wife. Yeah. Crawling and she's up like, no, stairs. I want people to see it. And you're yeah. like, God, I get that. But it's I also, just, I, I'm totally in Omar's shoes there where you're like, uh, oh, totally. Oh, it's God. just like, I mean, and, and of course, like there's moments where she is obviously going and having suicidal thoughts and we're going yeah. through them with her. Yes. And yikes. It's heavy. I think that, you know, what you're talking about with those suicidal ideations, like, boy, you get that, right? Like, like some of these people oh, yeah. where it, there's once, once she kind of realizes like, I want to get to the bottom of this, the story opens up to more than just her or, or the girl from England or this uh, mother from the Midwest um with her kids and then her daughter ends up getting it too but all of a sudden like we've opened up to you know we there's this kid and he's got this australian accent and he looks like he's in his early 20s and he's like i don't know how much longer i'm gonna hold on like i'm i'm watching my life fall apart around me like and i'm sitting in this room and i think it's really interesting that this movie touches upon the ways in which uh, Jennifer is able through technology to reach out to people from her room. And I was like, this seems novel, but not anymore. Right. Not after the last year where we've all, we've all been stuck in our rooms and we've all been on those like multiple zoom calls. And I was like, this is really interesting because the one guy, the one doctor that she interviews is like, this is the most u- unique interview I've ever done. And I was like, yeah, well, this came out in 2017. <clears throat> like, you've done a lot of these since then. But, yeah. you know, at the time, it was this feeling very much of like, this is the only way that she can do this because, you know, as, as Jennifer describes it. It's a great idea it, for Doc. Uh, it really is. Well, and, and it does. It utilizes so many different platforms and different ways that... that I've never really seen like there's moments of this doc that feel like a real traditional uh, mm-hmm. documentary, but then there's a lot of these moments where I'm like, oh, we're utilizing these different platforms in these ways to show like how she's able to connect with all these people, um, and I found that really really fascinating, and I and I really enjoyed that we were able to see that these doors were opened into sort of all these people's bedrooms. Yep. Where each one of them, even though they were like, they barely spoke the same language, they're from completely different walks of life, completely different ages. One of them's going, yeah, do you have to blah, blah, blah? And the other person goes, huh, yeah, all the time. And you go, oh my God, they all understand. Like how validating would that be on its own? Just to find other people that go, I believe you because it's happening to me too. No doubt. And that's what I was saying earlier is like the power of the internet. It- it's not always a bad thing, right? Like something like this is you, you wouldn't have ever gotten these perspectives if we didn't have the technology to be able to do that and get those perspectives of these people who can't really leave that room, you know, and they're getting help helped with. And she obviously was able to to go to some of these places, too, and, and, and film with them. And but a lot of them we get to know through these Zoom interviews and. You know, this was initially seen as like a new form of polio at the beginning. And there's a few heartbreaking moments that happen. I mean, the whole movie is pretty heartbreaking, yeah. obviously. But, uh, you know, she she gets this antiviral prescription. Yeah. And she starts walking. And this is a probably three-fourths through the movie. And it's weird to see her walking at this point. Because the, yeah. the whole movie she's been crawling or in bed or laying down. Or like on the floor, and so she's like walking around within a few days, and it's weird to see her live that normal life and be happy at that point in the film. But you see how quickly it swings the other way, where she's at a party uh, from this day that she's been happy, seeing friends, this big beautiful smile, and on the way home, they get out of the car, and on the porch she has this episode, and it is like crippling. And it's it is so, so it is sad. so scary. And you're just watching Omar be like, "What do I do? What am I supposed to do?" Yeah. And she's like, "Don't touch me. I can't be touched. I can't. I just I can't." Yeah. So now might be as good of an any time to just for full transparency's sake. Um, my older stepbrother John. Um, he had chronic fatigue syndrome and he passed away three years ago, I want to say. And for a real several years, 
it was like, I mean, a, one doctor at one point said, I think you have AIDS. And he's like, I doubt it. And he's like, well, it's some kind of an autoimmune. Like, I mean, he went through more doctors and see, he, he was one of the smartest people I ever met. I mean, also one of the most infuriating because he also had Asperger's. Uh, so he just would say whatever was on his mind. And sometimes you were like, oh my God, you're such an asshole. Uh, but, you know, he basically went right up to the line of having a medical degree. I mean, he had read every possible textbook there was try and figure out what was wrong with him. Wow. And the last two years of his life, finally, he was about completely bedridden. And, uh, you know, he was on hospice and it was like, there were still some people I know out in the, in the community that I knew that were like, oh, I think, isn't he just a hypochondriac? And I was like, oh, well, it doesn't seem like it. And then he died, and it was like, well, obviously he's not a hypochondriac because it actually killed him. So so the disease is what killed him, though? Yes. It wasn't a mental anything like that? No, it, I mean, it, 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 it shut down his organs. I mean, it, Damn. it you know, and so, but I remember... So did the- did this he, doc hit you in a in a in a, separate, a lot a different of the stuff that Jennifer tries is mm-hmm. you know these crazy m- macrobiotic uh, diets and then trying different uh, That's right. drug eating, cocktails e- and eating vegan diets, moving to drier climates. T- so uh, my t- brother, my brother moved from he used to live right up the street from from me, and he moved to Moab. Um, and yeah, he spent the last handful of his years of his life in Moab. And you know what? In the very beginning, same thing. Totally helped. Totally helped. Mm-hmm. And then it all comes back crashing down as a wave because... There, there's this th- this amazing scene with Omar setting up the tent so she could sleep outside because of the yep. toxicity and the molds. And maybe they're living in just this Petri dish that is making her feel this way. Right. And so he's building it and like... He's had to change his clothes twice, and she's like, "No, don't touch it." He's like, "What am I supposed to do?" Like this, this, it's this husband. I feel wife like I'm a crazy person. What do you it, want me to it's do? This, hu- and, this oh. husband wife moment where you're just like, "There's no answer oh. to what." To, there's no answer to uh, solution, but he justifiably gets pissed off because it's like, "I can't live like this." Well, how like, does he describe he- it? He says, "He says, put yourself in my shoes." Mm-hmm. That there is something that we can't see or measure or touch or get near that is making this happen to us. And she's like, I know, now put yourself in my shoes where we can't see or touch it or measure it, but it's happening to me and I have to tell you that it's happening. And you, they're, they're, boy, they're both scratching at the surface. I, I mean, this, they're both helpless, right? That, like, well, that, it's that's this inv- what it comes down to. Oh, my God. It's this invisible level of empathy that you just have to have for the situation. Mm-hmm. And, and and a really great um, case study or a sort of uh, uh, object lesson of when this doesn't work is, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting the woman's name, but the, the woman from the Midwest and her daughter also gets it. Yes, Cassie and, and her mom. Yeah, Ka- that's... It, and her yeah. husband actually leaves her. And mm-hmm. oh my God, this heartbreaking well, moment later on when they're sitting there and his eyes are welling up with tears. And he sort of is like the real version of John Goodman from Roseanne. Like he, that's who he is. He's sort of this like big guy, you know, and he's in like a hockey jersey kind of a thing. And he's sure. like, he's like, I just, I thought if I left you, this would end because I was enabling you. And so yeah. then I left you and it kept happening. When the daughter gets sick, oh my God, this is real. And he goes, I, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to make this up to you. And it's so, it's so hard, but, but at the same time, like we, we can't blame him because we are conditioned. Yep. We are conditioned in, in Western medicine to believe that because something might be in your mind, that means that you can, that, that you have choices. And, and the truth is, is that even if it is, quote unquote, just in your mind, like a mental illness, guess what? People still fucking kill themselves because of that. So even then doesn't mean they have any control over it, even if it is just in their mind, right? But but this is the stigma 
that Western medicine pours out to people in the public, right? Well, and I, I think the greatest example that's shown in this movie is that that situation in Denmark where the ambulance just comes and grabs this girl, Car- oh uh, Karina, God. and just takes her away because they don't define it as a physical a physical thing. It's psychiatric. This Dr. Perfink. Uh, Fink wh- is his is last like, name. Yeah. How? How is that but possible? He, he totally ignores it. Doesn't, does, you know, he gets called out in the street. People are screaming at him, all this stuff. He does not care. Yeah. Um, and that's a perfect example. But like, the parents had no say in that and they they locked her up they weren't even able to see her like they haven't seen parent, her since it's been like three parent, years yeah near the end they end up she ends up getting released and we right we, we get a, a little bit with her but like the fact that they can just come and take someone away without your consent uh, because they think it's a crazy person disease oh, i'm uh, sure as a parent it's like the most terrifying i mean that's something from a kafka short story <laughs> it's totally. not something that actually happens the uh you know and with cassie and her mom there that brings up the whole question of like is this genetic like is it possible that this is genetic like and i'm sure that may have been something you you had thought about as so, well so so actually and i and i know this and i can't remember who it is but 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 once i started watching this documentary i remember that at my stepbrother's funeral i can't remember who it was it was either my stepmother someone told me about this documentary but I had forgotten the name. You know, I'm at the funeral. So somebody mentions it, and then it goes sure, sure. in one area or the other. One of the women, not that's a main interviewee, but just somebody who pops up on one of those Zoom calls, is a cousin of my stepbrother. So they both have it. And actually, after uh, uh, in his will, when my stepbrother wrote his will, um, one of the things he wanted done before he was cremated was to have, he had a handful of biopsies taken um, after he passed, I think from his brain and liver, a couple different places that were sent to that institution uh, that's doing all this research and trying to get these grants passed. So he donated a bunch of his cells. Oh, that's cool. Basically for continued research of like, hey, this thing's about to kill me. <laughs> find it out. Well, please find out what the hell's going on. That doctor so, that they yeah. interview, who who has who has a daughter who has it, I believe. No son. Oh, no, he has a son. son who has oh it. my god! Oh, that's, and you that's don't, the dude, other... you do not see that coming. Because uh, no. you just see, you see. Obviously, he cares about doing this, and you're like, oh, isn't this great? There's all these uh, luminaries and doctors that are willing to do this, and then you follow that doctor home. Sure. Yeah. And here's that son that's an incredible <clears throat> photographer. That's right. The, and his, now he's in the, his room with the with those uh, earmuff protectors on. Un, under a blanket. The oh, whole time. my like, God. It's tra- so fucking sad. His, his, sto- his story is, is definitely one of the more tragic. But his dad, Ron, is the guy being interviewed. And he's the doctor. And he mentions there there's never been a disease that they've collected this many data points on people before. Yes. And they're trying everything possible to figure it out. The, the the tragic part with his story is just his mom sitting outside the door just so he doesn't commit suicide. Holy shit, that was so... She's just, like, leaning the door, listening to him, and, like, wanting to step away. And it's just, like, I can't imagine... And there's a huge sign on the door that says, no talking, underlined, mm-hmm. where even just someone talking is so... I mean, well, and it's interesting when they get to the cellular level and they're talking about this idea of aerobic versus anaerobic energy that a, a human being has in their body and you just go and jennifer says it herself she's like i feel like i'm at a battery that's at 10 percent all the time so i can get up and sure. i can walk around that's a great description i, I like that um, and that once that once that energy is spent you are screwed potentially for days right because for there sure. is no charger you're just sitting there at at one percent mm-hmm. and sometimes it's resulting in uh seizures and people i mean it's mm-hmm. so and and i think the fact that and jennifer touches on this a, a couple of different doctors do but this idea of of that throughout history there's always been oh this this group of people we put over here mm-hmm. right because we don't know and honestly 
I mean, what, Pulcher? If we were to rewind 20 years ago, and we, you know, we talked about your son uh, in the Life Animated episode, but like, if, if, if we were exactly the same, but it was 20 years ago, Caden would not get the help that he needed because he'd be surrounded by doctors who had gone to medical school who'd be telling him to snap out of it. For sure, yeah. He got kicked out of so many daycares because he was too disruptive. For sure. No, and it still happens. And with something like this that's even lesser known, it's it's hard to fight. It's hard to fight for, you know? And it, especially to that point I was making earlier of if people are you know think it's made up how are they even going to get funding to look into this like they're never going to not, what was the story gonna... they were like oh the doctors came to tahoe they did the tests and then they mm -hmm. went skiing for two days and you're like well that's just great thanks a bunch docs yeah like, well i mean it comes down to basically not doing anything can be a curse right like you yep. just sit there with your own brain and human mind and go through all the emotions of a human and that's all you can do, uh, right? You can't. You don't even have energy to. You don't want to have energy to turn on the TV or read a book or. Okay, whatever. here you go. Here you go. It's not just. It is that. It's all of that, and then with a nice fat frosting of disbelief over the top of it, a nice fat frosting mm -hmm. of non-validation, sure. right? That people are like. Yeah, I don't know, man. He's still doing that thing where he won't get out of bed. And you're like, dude, I can't, I fucking can't get out of bed. He hasn't talked in a year or whatever. Yes. It's yeah, it's like it's um, not a phase he's going through. Obviously, there's something deeply, deeply physically wrong with him. No doubt. Um, the, uh, this idea, uh, the, the idea of this is caused by some distant trauma that the person maybe can't remember. What do you think of that, like... I think that's that grasping. It. I think that's grasping yeah, at straws. I, so too. I, yeah. I, I, so while, while psychoanalysis via Freud is always interesting to me, it's always interesting. It's fun to talk about. And I think there's definitely times where it's super valid. Yeah. I'm more of a, uh, I'm more of a gestalt theory kind of a person. I'm like, look at the whole, look at everything that's happening with them. Like, if this is a person like Jennifer Bria, who is successful and happy, married the love of her life, wants to do all of these things and can't, it'd be different if it's like, oh, well, she, she had to take her, she had to take the bar exam and she knew she was going to fail. So all of a sudden, like, she has a sleeping sickness and can't get up. You could be like, oh, I could do some psychoanalysis here and look at something. But to see people where they literally their entire life has crumbled away to nothing. Like the idea that there could be just some random trauma from long ago that cropped up now. Yeah. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a compounding factor that's making things worse, right? Like, so you really do get sick because some shit's really going on. And then once it does, it causes anxiety well, that third one else. here with yeah. that anxiety, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. that's from the trauma. But the yeah. first two things that happened really happened. They happened to you. And, dude, I got to say, like, when, when this conversion disorder stuff came up, oh, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. that's what I was diagnosed with. I was diagnosed with conversion disorder. I remember. And, and it, like, it's like the most depressing thing ever is for someone to be like, your brain believes your body is doing X, Y, and Z. And you go, okay, how do we change it? What do we do, doc? Hypnosis? What do we do? And they're like, I don't know, man. Some people snap out of it and some people never do. And you're like, so <laughs> you, nobody knows. So nobody, nobody fucking knows. No, no obviously. That's I the mean, <laughs> worst answer that a person in a white lab coat can ever give you. Because the white lab coat, like, Sometimes has that's power. The answer. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the white mm -hmm. lab coat has power. You want that person to be like, I have the answer. And here's, here's the bottle. And unfortunately for me, this is part of the solution is beer. <laughs> so take it for what it's worth. But Well, I, you know, we do the recap at the end of kind of what, what, where they are now kind of thing. And I have yeah. to say, there was mostly good endings there. And then, of course, there's some that were pretty much the same thing happening. 
um, and not a lot had changed for them. But I think we do have to mention, too, that Jennifer and, I believe, Omar, too, they're Harvard students, right? Yeah. And so her whole journey through this, she's trying to ask questions that haven't really ever been asked about this disease before. I love right? her big board, man. Her big yeah. her big uh, Charlie Day board of, like, uh, <laughs> uh, he's got all the yarn, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, it's like, you know, I love seeing that because I'm like, She's really going through each step and she's like, okay, we need to, uh, you know, in, in, inject these uh, mitochondrial cells or whatever. Like, all right, I'm doing it or whatever crazy shit. And like, they try it for X amount of time and then they do a study and they're like, okay, never mind. Let's move on to the next thing. They tried the hookworm thing. Like, that's crazy. Oh. Yeah, no thanks. She did get to do whippets, though, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I thought that was a funny, weird, <laughs> weird solution. Uh, <clears throat> beautiful way to end the movie, and this is the last thing I'll end on, is this touching, like, weird perspective of one of her cameramen out and is basically has a, a, a dolly or something, and he's kind of just rolling the camera to this beautiful sunset on the beach. And she's just in, like, in oh. Australia, in the Australian outback. So like, is that what it is? Yeah. So like um, thousands of miles from where she is and she's going, Oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. And then she just cracks and, yeah. and starts crying and it is. And, and you feels like she's running, right? Oh, uh, really interesting movie and, uh, a disease and disability that I had never heard of before. And I thought uh, through another wrench into this festival here of uh, these underrepresented, you know, disabilities that people have to deal with that rarely get taken seriously or rarely get sympathy uh, when honestly, that's all they want. Yeah. Well, and I mean, and it, you know, I mean, it's a. Uh, they want people to it, listen. And it all sounds of like a, it's, it sounds like a Hallmark card slash, <laughs> uh, you know. It sounds like a Hallmark card slash uh, uh, bumper sticker, and it, it probably is. But this idea of everybody's fighting a battle, like these things are true, you know? And I think mm-hmm. that... Why would someone make that up? Well, and and even if part of their brain is, quote unquote, making it up, I mean, that's how trauma works too, right? Like technically, mm-hmm. PTSD a person comes back from war and they themselves maybe physically weren't injured, but their PTSD could lead them to suicide or it could ruin their marriage or it could ruin their job. It can ruin their life. And no one thinks that PTSD is made up, but they don't have physical wounds from it. Right. So, so we're every couple of years, we get closer to this approximation of, of the spaces from where, the way that the neurons inside of this jellyfish inside our skull works to the way that it affects our physical being and our health, we're getting better, but there's still (laughs) these, these gaps in there and where those gaps are, where we mock that shit, or we somehow think that it's less valid than actually having your hand blown off. Like, I'm sorry, but if you know people who have these kinds of illnesses or disorders, you will see that it like, there is no difference, right? Like this brain is how all the rest of this functions yep. and, and vice versa, right? Because I think if you do have your hand blown off, then your brain can, uh, uh, you know, misfire Oh, my hand keeps clenching. You're like, oh, well, open your hand. And you're like, I don't have one anymore. It got blown off. So just my brain thinks there is one. And that's what's hurting me. Well, how? The... Now that's all in your head again, right? But these are, the, these are real things that people deal with. And, and I think Wild. that we need to be much more mindful that, like, all of it's connected. Whether it's, whether it's mental or whether it's physical, <laughs> it's all the same. Hell of a festival, uh, yes. really interesting uh, to get these different perspectives and hopefully give a little bit of exposure to some of these disabilities that uh, uh, that people are going through and that you should really listen to these people when, when they're telling you something. Um, <clears throat> we are going to do an awesome uh, Forgotten Gem next week that I absolutely think you should tune in for. 
This is a word a Werner Herzog documentary <sighs> that we did a long time ago called The Land of Silence and Darkness. It is truly a forgotten gem if you have not seen that movie. Buckle up. It is a, Oh my god. Is Please a play classic. along cuz yeah. it is it is a classic. It's it is a forgotten gem. His first gem. documentary ever, too. And and I don't I feel like always he's reinventing the documentary, but on sure. his first one, this was unlike any documentary that had come out at that period of time. Like this no is doubt. so different. Um, so and oh truly a forgotten I gem. Because I, I don't know how many people know about that movie and yeah. they should, because it is a highly effective film. Um, and just like a uh, just wild ride. So tune in next week for our forgotten gem to end out the disabilities documented festival. Then we're going to start a new festival and we have some new segments and stuff coming up that we're really excited to share with you guys. So, yes. Uh, sorry, we skipped last week. Uh, we are back at it uh, hard now, and we're excited to have you. Please like and subscribe if you have any uh, desire to keep watching. We'd love you to join the community. And, and if I may, really quick, I'm just going to uh, interrupt. Um, this this episode is is dedicated to both your puppy Serpico and my puppy Oliver, uh, who right. both passed within the last like month and a half, which is. Part of the reason why we were a little late on, on, on these episodes. So Yeah, so please forgive us for that. Uh, there were some heartbreaking times uh, yeah. over this past month. So um, love to both of those doggy poos. Yep. And uh, we will see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thanks.